Hello everyone, Professor Helmling here. I wanted to um, record a video for this selection, even though I won't be able to go through the entire piece. Um, I wanted to break it down a little bit for you. Uh, this is a long but very important historical document. Uh, I do recommend you read the whole version. However, if you are really strapped for time, you can Google abridged versions that kind of give you sort of a highlight reel version of this. But um, uh, I, I really like to teach this piece after we've done Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginia Convention. And if you watched my video um, or heard a lecture from me about that speech, I always say that that speech is an introductory course to rhetoric in and of itself. Like you can get a good understanding of the basics of rhetoric just by analyzing Patrick Henry's speech to a Virginia convention. Now this document, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail, this is a master class in rhetoric. If ha Patrick Henry was the introduction, this is the advanced class because it has so much rich rhetoric and rhetorical strategies at work here uh, that you, you really see how it kind of almost seems like he's building on the foundation of uh, Henry and just taking it up several notches. So like I said, we won't have a time in this video for me to go through the entire letter, but I wanted to kind of show you some of what I mean uh, when I say that it is a master class in rhetoric because uh, it is so wonderfully and meticulously crafted. So before we get into the text itself, a little bit of uh, background on it. Um, this was, of course, from the Civil Rights Movement. And um, King wrote it um, after having been confined uh, to jail for protesting. And um, very much in keeping with the tradition of civil disobedience described by Henry David Thoreau, practiced by Gandhi, um, and you'll see he, he references the principles of nonviolent resistance in the letter as well. But specifically, this is an answer to another letter. Um, several church figures had written an open letter, sort of, well, criticizing, if not condemning, King's movement. And as you'll see from his direct reaction, the gist of this letter that he's responding to was your movement, while your aims are obviously righteous and just, while what you want, Dr. King, is justified, your movement is causing too much disruption and it is, um, it is too dangerous to proceed this way and you and the movement should be more patient and accept more gradual change and petition for it in different ways. So they were really arguing against mass protests and mass demonstrations and um, advocating, as people always do, to large social changes. They were advocating, whoa, 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 this is scary, we slow down. And of course, King is going to answer this and say why their thinking is wrong. So, um, as we did with Patrick Henry in the video that I posted on that, um, let's go ahead and go through kind of line by line, break down some of the rhetorical strategies and techniques that he's using here. And uh, again, we, we won't be able to do the whole thing. It's, it's fairly long, but uh, let me show you some of these great opening moves and, and the way that he is able to just masterfully control the rhetoric here. So he begins, Dear Fellow Clergymen, While confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. 
Okay, so his language in this opening paragraph is very carefully chosen, obviously. And notice the parallels to Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry began, began his speech by saying the, um, that the very worthy gentleman that preceded him, he, said he had nothing but respect for them, and you know, very, very equivocating, very conciliatory at first towards those men. And you, you see King is doing something very similar. He's saying, you are men of genuine goodwill, and so I'm going to take the time to answer you. But also notice the sly move in the opening uh, paragraph here, where he's like, I seldom take the time to answer my criticisms, because you all just get in the way. <laughs> all these people criticize me. I've got constructive work to do. I don't have time for um, you know, answering every person who lobbed some unthought-out criticism his way. So that's kind of a little bit of an ethos move there. We'll talk more about ethos in, in a moment. Um, but notice these starting very similar sim similarly to Patrick Henry with, oh, you guys are good guys. Uh, we just happen to disagree. Let me tell you why. So let's see how he builds on that. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against, quote, outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational, and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. All right, so we can see here the basic move that King is using here is, again, counter-argument. The man, the clergyman who wrote this open letter uh, criticizing him have described him as an outsider. He's coming into these communities with these protests and stirring up these communities. That's their view. And he is saying, no, that's not how it is. And notice that in the course of establishing that he was, quote, invited here, has, quote, organizational ties here, he lays out not just his credentials, but a lot of important information about his organization and about the movement. Okay. So uh, this is what we call ethos. You know, there are three broad appeals that Aristotle talked about in rhetoric. He talked about pathos, which are emotional appeals. He talked about logos, which are logical appeals, appeals to reason. He talked about ethos, which are appeals to reputation. Now, I'll tell you that a lot of people use ethos these days in a very broad way. And so anytime anybody's kind of like um, relying on anyone's reputation to make a point, they call that an ethos move. Aristotle didn't really talk about it that way. Aristotle meant when the speaker, the person conveying the rhetoric, is establishing their own reputation. And that's what King is doing right here. This is definitely an ethos move. He's saying, I am president of this organization. This is no lightweight organization. We have 85 affiliated organizations throughout the South. Okay, we are all over the South. We're a massive organization. And look at the way he describes it. Staff, educational, financial resources. Um, we are prepared to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. He's establishing the ethos of him as the president, but also of the organization by describing how well organized it is and how careful their methods are. And you'll see that this is a theme that he's going to um, lay in to here. So this is very much ethos, very much logos. He's saying, well, you're mistaken if you think we are outsiders. And here's why. And I'm going to give you all this evidence. So he's starting off with a very reasonable, very measured, very distanced professional tone. And one of the things we said about Patrick Henry that made his rhetoric so effective is how well he could uh, modulate and shift his tone. Now with Patrick Henry, he started with that conciliatory tone and then built up slowly to the impassioned tone where by the end he's you know basically shouting, give me liberty or give me death. So he just built from one tone to another. 
Again, what you're going to see here with King that makes this masterful is he's going to move back and forth seamlessly, organically, and just really control the tone like he's turning a dial up and down. Um, and it's really expertly done. So let's watch for that as we go through here. So he just finished by saying, I am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. So again, very logical. Look at the next line. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Okay, I had to pause because I get goosebumps. Just look at the way he ratchets it up. He's like, well, no, you see, gentlemen, I am... Uh, I am here because we have organization size. We're a big organization. Also, this is wrong. You know, the way he just spins the top and is like, I am here in Birmingham because injustice is here. And watch how he backs this up. Remember, his audience is clergymen. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. So you see, like I said, he, he shifts the tone here. And this is much more of a pathos appeal. But it's also very much directed at his audience. Remember, he's writing to clergymen. And so he justifies his presence there to fight injustice, not just in terms of the organizational ties he has in the paragraph before, but in terms of the religious beliefs that he knows these men supposedly share with him. He ties it into the history of Christianity because this is something that should move them as well. The implied message here, and you'll see him build it even more, is like, I'm here because injustice is here. Why aren't you? You are men of faith. You know this is wrong. Why aren't you here fighting with me? So, again, expert move there. Let's see how he builds this up. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with a narrow provincial outsider agita outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its borders. Okay, so again, with, this is all counter-argument. He started his counter-argument up here by saying, oh, we're not outsiders. We're not outsiders because we're tied here. And then he builds the counter-argument more by saying, it doesn't matter if I'm an outsider, injustice is here. So I'm not an outsider, but even if I was, it wouldn't matter because injustice is here. And finally, he cements this by saying, you know what? There are no outsiders. So he trashes their point with these count three separate counter arguments to just destroy this part of their uh, argument against him. See, so again, masterful. Uh, also notice that in this paragraph, he's laying in some figurative language. We're tied in a single garment of destiny. So he's tying in um, these ideas with some figurative language. And I mentioned in my Patrick Henry video that figurative language is often used as a pathos appeal to, you know, make us feel um, through the use of metaphor or simile. He also has um, some what I call aphoristic lines. Now, an aphorism is like a quotable saying. And as a matter of fact, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., many lines from his speech have become aphorisms. Um, but these kind of succinct, sort of quotable bites like this one, that again is now very much a line that we recognize from the letter, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So lots of rhetorical strategies and techniques going on throughout this. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis 
that de deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. Okay, so now he's shifting to a different part of his argument against these guys. And they're saying, oh, these, these demonstrations, they're just causing trouble, right? They're, they're, they're disruptive. And his interesting move here is he's like, you know, yes, you're right. It is unfortunate that there are these demonstrations. But he's telling them, what do you want to focus on? You want to focus on the demonstrations? Or do you want to focus on the injustice that makes them necessary? Okay, so that is a, a real, and, and this is the kind of thinking that gets um, used a lot with these protests, is that people are like, oh, well, oh, you, 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 this is causing trouble, this is causing chaos. But what about the injustice underneath them? So that's what he's saying here. That's the argument that he's saying here. And so that's a very um, relevant still to some of what we see today. You know, you see the same sort of reasoning being used. I'm recording this video after the summer of 2020. And you see the same sort of complaints about the uh, Black Lives Matter protests uh, in the streets of America today. People focusing on the disruption instead of on the injustice. So that's his argument here. Now, let's see how he builds on that. Below that... He's going to go into some heavy logos. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Now, notice the, lo the logic here. He's, he's making the, the reasonable case for this is how our protests work. We have this system. So he's, he's explaining that this is no just let's just swarm the streets kind of movement. We have a system. We have the process of determining whether just injustice exists, negotiation, self-purification, direct action. He's going to go into these in more detail. But also notice that he, he lays in some of the evidence in a very logical way of this is why Birmingham matters. Look at its record. But also look, and this is so important for tone, is word choice. Look at some of his word choice, like hard, brutal facts of the case. Word choice really helps tone. And so just sneaking that into, into a, pro, a paragraph that is largely logos driven Choosing words like grossly unjust also injects that pathos element, that emotional appeal into it. So he's going to expand on this argument here with this paragraph. Then last September came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed returned. The others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct 
action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be a byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's mayoral election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action until after Election Day, when we discovered that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff. We decided again to postpone action until the day after the runoff, so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issues. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connor defeated, and to this end we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt that our direct action program could be delayed no longer. Now in these two paragraphs, he's giving a little lesson of their engagement in Birmingham, a little uh, history of what they've planned and what they've waited through here. Now remember, one of the main arguments that these clergymen made in their open letter is, be patient, wait, why now? Why rush? And so what he's showing here in these paragraphs is we have waited. We have been patient. We've been careful. This moment was carefully chosen. So that's what he's establishing here through these very logos-driven paragraphs. You may ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins? What marches and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. So here he addresses one of their complaints is that, okay, this is causing trouble. Why not just negotiate? And of course, he's just raising the obvious point that you've got to give the other side of the uh, table, especially when they're an entrenched power structure, uh, as we had in the South uh, during the, before the Civil Rights Movement, during and sadly after. Um, you've got to give them a reason to negotiate. You've got to demonstrate your social power. And so these these actions are what uh, do that, this direct action. But look at some of the other moves he makes in here in the course of making that argumentative point. He alludes, first of all, to Socrates. Remember, allusion is a reference to some element of culture that um, doesn't get fully explained so that the, the reader, the audience member, must have some knowledge of this to fully appreciate the point that uh, the speaker is making. And so by bringing in Socrates, of course, he's connecting his argument to one of the founders of Western thought. Um, uh, Socrates was immensely influential on ancient Greek culture, which then was influential on all of European culture, which then is influential on the world. So he's connecting it to that. But also look that he's using antithesis quite a bit here. And um, again, if you watched my Patrick Henry video, we talked about antithesis, the, the this or that, liberty or death. So here we have the dark depths of prejudice and racism changing to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. And this is very long and very wordy, very grandiose. But watch how he returns to antithesis at the end of the paragraph to make the point more succinctly, monologue rather than dialogue. So whereas one voice has power in 
the um, racist society in the South. They're seeking to create a dialogue where more voices are heard. Let's continue. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I had my that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this query is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Boutwell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Boutwell is a much more gentle person than Mr. Connor, they are both segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. I have hope that Mr. Boutwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation, but he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Lamentably, it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust power, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. So this is an interesting interplay in this paragraph because he's making this contrast between groups and individuals. And notice that the individual he focuses on earlier, Boutwell, the new mayor, who was elected, he says, fortunately over the very, very, very intolerably racist Mr. Connor is still very intolerably racist himself. And so he's saying, we've got to bring this pressure on. So he's continuing the point about the timeliness of, and again, like the thing that is so masterful about the rhetoric here is that he doesn't just rest with one counter argument. Every point that these men, the clergymen made in their letter, he is going to absolutely destroy with counter argument. So he's still working on the idea of timeliness. He says, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. Again, look at the language, the figurative language, unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait, has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. All right, now like I said, this is a very long letter, and you can see this paragraph coming up is very long, but I wanted to get to uh, this one at least uh, before we wrap up this kind of introduction to this, this document. Uh, I mentioned what makes this so masterful, one of the many things that makes it so masterful is the way he shifts tone and he combines those different types of appeals. You know, we've got some ethos, we've got some pathos, we've got some logos. Check out this paragraph. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed towards gaining political independence, but we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Look at that line. So he's talking about social change in around the world. As the world decolonizes after World War II, you've got nations in Asia and Africa becoming independent. And he's saying they're moving at a jet-like speed. And he contrasts that. He contrasts that. So he juxtaposes that with the idea that we still creep at horse and buggy pace. Toward what? Is it political independence? No. Towards having access to something as simple as a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Because, of course, many of these uh, dining facilities in the South were segregated uh, at this time. And so the way he kind of sets the stage for this, look, we've got all over the world people gaining their independence and their freedom. And yet here in America, supposed land of the free, this is the reality. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, it's connecting back to wait again. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, 
kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters when you have seen the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking daddy why do white people treat colored people so mean when you take a cross-country jive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no ho motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title, Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living Living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Ladies and gentlemen, that was one sentence. He's got parallel structure in here. He's got lots of beautiful figurative language. Um, I think my favorite and the one that always gets to me when he's talking about the image of his daughter is the ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her mental sky. Beautiful figurative language, masterful use of parallel structure, um, just powerful, powerful stuff as he connects so many different levels of the injustice that um, African Americans have faced in the United States. So many different levels. You know, he talks about... The, um, it'd be, be right before this sentence, the 340 years, but he talks about all the different injustices, but then he makes it so personal when he gets to his children. And, uh, this one is, a, well, I, I was about to say always moved me, but I guess it's moved me more <laughs> since I've been a parent myself, you know, this section, um, because it just, he, he puts so much passion into making it real for these white clergymen who have never really, obviously, never really thought about and taken the time to be empathetic to what it was like to suffer this kind of discrimination. So um, that's the moment I had to get at least this far to, to share that with you and my thoughts with the, about that section on you because it's so powerful and so brilliantly constructed. Just this rolling sentence of parallel structure, all this imagery, um, all these uh, figurative uh, devices, it's just amazing. So, <clears throat> uh, like I said, it's a very long letter, and I won't uh, go on in the video any further, um, but look for all these techniques as you read through the rest of it. Um, uh, again, if you are really strapped for time, you can look up some abridged um, abridged versions to kind of get the highlights, um, but make sure you're reading his actual language and not just a summary because uh, you've got to appreciate um, his masterful control of diction and tone in this, uh, this piece. All right, so I'll call it there, and I'll see you in the forums for discussion.